Well, um, you know, I hope the book will be useful for people yeah. and uh, of interest. What message do you hope people take away from the book? I think that, uh, you know, there are really two messages. One is that um, there are these variations in emotional style, yeah. uh, and um, there is no one style that's best. Yeah. That, that's sort of message one. Yeah. Uh, different styles are, uh, are more well suited to certain people in certain yeah. environments. Yeah. Uh, and the second message is that if a person finds that his or her emotional style is not working well for them, mm -hmm. there are actually things that they're in their power to do to yeah. change them. Uh, and it's worth a try. Absolutely. Uh, so those are really the two most yeah. important messages. I mean, both of those messages strike me as cutting against the grain of a lot of popular assumptions about how the mind works. And I think, you know, my sense is there's this craving among a lot of people, or just, just in society in general, about we assume there's one particular kind of mind, that there's one ideal template for human nature. If you deviate from that, you deserve a diagnosis. Um, and, and, you know, what interests me is I think all the different ways, just, just, just in line with your message, that, that whether it's different styles of emotional regulation or even just different styles of thinking, whether it's, you know, a, that paper that came out last week from research at UCL, which are those with autism, um, adults with autism, they showed much higher bandwidth in informational processing. So mm -hmm. you know, it's a very, very difficult task. I took a sample of it online. Completely, I couldn't track these letters being flashed very quickly. And you got to monitor this gray squiggle outside the box and give me enough letters, and I'm just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But those with autism can handle twice as much information as me. So, so just even this disorder that we assume is, a lot of people assume is, is just a deviation. Um, it's actually just a different style of thinking it, exactly. with, its, with its pluses and minuses. Exactly, and in the book I talk about um, you know autism as an example, yeah. and uh, you know one of the emotional styles of dimensions I call social intuition, which is about the accuracy of decoding nonverbal yeah. cues of emotion, facial expression, yeah. tone of voice, body posture, and um, there are a significant fraction of individuals on the autism spectrum who do poorly on that, but. Yeah. You know, they're, they're also, those are people who may actually uh, prefer to interact with a machine. You know? yeah. and, uh, and they can do enormously yeah. well. And, um, yeah. uh, and we need people like that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and you look at dyslexia, and there's interesting evidence that people with dyslexia have better peripheral perception yes. and better at the visual gist. Yeah. And, you know, I, one of the studies I talk about in my book um, is those with ADHD. Um, and, and people score low on levels of latent inhibition, so they're more distractible in general. That they score higher in real-world tests of creative achievement. Yeah. Um, so I mean, just it's we're so eager to pigeonhole people right. and, and, and to just give them a diagnosis and to treat that difference. But right. I mean, I think it's a very important message to get across to people that that, that the pluralism of human nature is a tremendous asset. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think people are surprised by how much they can change? Their, their affective or cognitive style? I think they, for people who haven't sort of tried that on as a, yeah. as a possibility, I think they are in the short. Yeah. Uh, and you know, our, we have data showing that two weeks of training, 30 minutes a day, is sufficient to produce behavioral and neural changes wow. in, in otherwise complete novice yeah. individuals. So uh, we're not talking the full ten thousand hours of we're practice not talking here. The ten thousand hours, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Did that result surprise you that that it didn't take that much? That we are such masses of wet clay that you know. Well, an hour know, a day for two weeks. An hour, so. Half hour a day. Half hour a day. Half yeah. hour a day. Half an hour a day. But you know, it's, um, it's people often ask me, well, do those changes last? Mm -hmm. And you know, what the, I ask them if you exercise, if you're someone who hasn't done physical exercise, yeah. and then exercise for two weeks, thirty minutes yeah. a day, you probably would feel different. But certainly, if you stopped exercising, of course, it's not going to last. And yeah. I, you know, I don't think these effects are going to last. Well, plasticity is a double-edged sword. I mean, it, it means we can change. It also means you have to work to maintain the change. Exactly. Exactly, and so you know the the the, the hope is that uh, the work with children will provide kids yeah. with skills that become lifelong habits. Yeah, uh, that they are techniques that they can invoke. Yeah, the, what in whatever times they need them, uh, and they can just use this on a regular basis. Yeah, and it really becomes part of their daily routine. I mean, is that where you see a lot of your future research directed towards? 
toward towards towards younger children simply because it's you know it's about giving them habits which which don't even require the you know the conscience the conscious intervention and the conscious interference with you know with the in, emotions in, yeah in part in in part you know it's uh, I I'm someone who will I think forever have a difficult time. Um, you know, completely narrowing my focus, yeah. but uh, I mean, everything we do in one way or yeah. another is related to uh, emotion, attention, yeah. and brain, um, uh, and with an unswerving focus on individual differences, that is, differences in one yeah. people. Um, uh, but within that, there's, you know, just a, a lot going on, yeah. and, and there's, you know, we're, we're also, we, we're very interested in how these circuits in the brain interact with the body, yeah. and um, we were talking about William James before. I have no doubt if he were around, he'd be uh, closely following your research, if not working side by side in the lab. Well, he's uh, certainly here <laughs> with mine. Me too. Um, I, I mean, William James always reminds me, one of my favorite lines of his is, my first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. And I think one of the ironies of York, I'm not sure irony is the right word here, is, is that he, you know, here's a neuroscientist using very rigorous methods of, of studying these three pounds of meat inside our head. And I think most people associate neuroscience with somehow the, you know, the dissolution of free will, that if we can understand the brain, we'll realize we're just automatons acting out right. circuitry. And yet, I think your research is such an important reminder that in the end, we can control our attention. We can get better at controlling our attention. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you ever think about, these are very grandiose questions, I know. Do you ever think about free will in the context of your research? Yes, yeah, I definitely have. And, and you know, I certainly um, think that our work is very relevant to that and uh, clearly suggests that we, we really are yeah. capable of um, changing our brains yeah. uh, by transforming our minds. And it really has to do with free will. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, and I think that, um, you know, I think that there is actually some specific neuroscience research which is really interesting and relevant to this and I think that um, uh, I, I think that one of the problems in certain kinds of psychopathology particularly uh, certain types of depression mm -hmm. is an abnormality in the will yeah. uh, and so the will yeah. to change is actually impaired wow. uh, and I think this is reflected in um, in abnormalities in the anterior syndrome which uh, is uh, Very interesting. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, you just plug into kind of rumination and, and you get stuck in this recursive loop where you can't... Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, um, you know, it turns out that uh, there, there's now quite a few papers in the literature, you know, some from us and some from other other groups showing in a variety, with a variety of different kinds of treatments that um, pre-treatment anterior singular activity predicts treatment response in wow. patients with depression. Um, and I think it really, so I mean, cognitive control and, and I think a lot of it has to do with this issue of, of the will to change. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's something, that the anterior cingulate is reflecting something about the will to change. And no matter what kind of treatment you're giving a patient with depression, they, wow. they have to have, they have to believe in it. Yeah. Um, uh, and they have to believe that change is possible or else it's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's also so interesting in terms of people have identified, obviously, the ACC with attentional switching and, and um, cognitive control and, you know, it's almost and as conflict if, monitoring. And, and conflict monitoring. It's almost as if you, you know, you, you get stuck in this cycle of rumination and you just can't break out. You, you, you can't step outside it. You can't move the spotlight somewhere else. That, that's right. That's right. And I think that, you know, in terms of conflict monitoring, one of the things I think about with a patient with depression is there's a conflict between, in, when a patient is depressed, between the demands and expectations of everyday life yeah. and their current mood state. Yeah. And part of change is actually registering that as a conflict. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't register that as a conflict, then the, there, there is no impulse to change. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I think that the, the, the anterior singular finding is in part about that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, do you see that as, in a sense, I mean, does it give you hope for potential talk therapies or, or means of modulating the interior cingulate without having to take a pill? Yes, definitely, definitely. I, I mean, I definitely think that there are, you know, and again, it's, it's, 
Um, and I, I've, one of the things that I talk about, uh, and I've mentioned it in the book, is this idea of neurally inspired behavioral interventions. Okay. So developing behavioral interventions based upon knowledge of the brain. Yeah. Uh, and when you think about the behavioral interventions that exist, which, you know, not to denigrate them, many are very useful, yeah. but they, they have not been developed with an understanding of the brain. Yeah. Uh, and we're now at the point, I think, where we can begin to really develop interventions based yeah. upon knowledge of the brain. And I think that um, this whole issue of will is an extremely important one because we can actually give people some simple experiences to uh, actually give them a taste of what it means to be in control and to exercise control. Such as, can you give us an example? Well, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what flavor it okay. would be, but um, uh, even uh, uh, things that are as simple as um, regulating their attention. Yeah. So you can actually show a person that if they direct their attention to one set of cues, they'll actually pick up certain things that they yeah. missed mm -hmm. um, if their attention is not directed at that. Uh, I mean, you can even use, you know, use some examples of like change blindness and yeah. things of that sort and then actually instruct Very people that if you pay attention to certain things, you actually... I mean, this also reminds me of, of some of your work with patients that are into PTSD in terms of modulating their breath, modulating their heart rate, um, yeah. and, and, and controlling their effective response, realizing that you, know, you can, via your attention, mediate what you feel and, and these visceral changes in your body. Exactly. I think that's another kind of route to it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a way of sort of tweaking this circuit behaviorally. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think it's going to be, again, uh, a panacea yeah. and I don't think everyone will respond, but certainly um, given the alternatives, I think it's worth a try and there are very few side effects. Abs <laughs> absolutely. No, no, that's so, I mean, it's just, that's fascinating to think about neuroscience informing Talk therapy, yeah. uh, just 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 our knowledge of the brain allowing us to change it via the mind. Right, and the the other thing is when you think about it from the perspective of neuroscience, the idea of talk therapy of going to someone for forty five minutes a week yeah. and thinking that you can actually produce behavioral change that way is lunacy. <laughs> I mean, it's just complete it, lunacy. Yeah. It's, it's such a cockamamie idea. Well, I always thought of talk therapy in terms of like memory consolidation. That that if you really wanted to come up with a reductionist justification for it would be that we know that the act of remembering a memory changes the memory itself, that, that memory right. is an iterative process. So maybe you can make the case that you're taking these upsetting memories, these traumatic memories, and we're calling them in a safe Right, and I think place. there is that. And, 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 you know, so, but, but, that's, but certainly I think everyone should agree that these are techniques which we can improve by incorporating this new knowledge we have about how right. it works. Right, and part of it is, has to do with more regularity of practice. Yeah. Uh, and that's something, you know, from the meditation work yeah. that I think is really relevant to all other kinds of training. Yeah. And, you know, it's certainly the case that with musical training, with sports training, any kind of training where real expertise is being cultivated, yeah. they, everyone understands that. That's, yeah. Um, it, well, I mean, that, that to me is one of the most provocative messages of your book, um, that, that happiness, as you put it, is a skill. It's something like anything else we can get better at. That that our emotions, we can, you know, we have a talent for emotional regulation, and we have to work at that talent. We have to work at that skill. It's a craft, and you have to put in the put in the hours of deliberate practice. Yeah, yeah. That even though we're always in the midst of these moods, we can absolutely we can influence them. That's absolutely. A, I think that's a pretty powerful message.